All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the latest in the GBO Science Lunch Talk series. Um, this week, we have Anna Kaufman, who is a fourth year, I think I have that right, graduate student at the University of Pennsylvania. And today we'll be hearing her talk about her work using the Simmons Observatory Large Aperture Telescope Receiver. Um, so when you are ready, take it away, Anna. Oops. Hi everyone, um, I'm Anna Kaufman, as Jesse said. Uh, I'm a graduate student here at Penn. I work for Mark Devlin and I'll be present presenting today on behalf of the SOU Penn LATR group, um, which like I said, is led by Mark Devlin. And I'll be talking about the Simons Observatory Large Aperture Telescope Receiver. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. So just a brief outline of what I'll be talking about today. I'm gonna introduce us to some of the scientific motivations behind the Simons Observatory, um, specifically why we care about the CMB. Then I'll give you a brief overview of the instruments and whatnot included in uh, the Simons Observatory. And then also um, we'll dive into the telescope design for both the LAT, the LATR and the optical components comp uh, uh, contained inside. We'll talk about the current status and then some of the future outlooks and what are our plans uh, for the next coming years with the LATR. Um, we also recently published a paper uh, detailing the receiver. So if you have any questions or want more information, um, I can point you to the paper. All right, so just to dive into what exactly motivates us scientifically uh, regarding the CMB to try and build these experiments, to try and explore um, the submillimeter wavelengths. Um, so we can talk first a little bit about uh, the CMB itself and why we actually see the CMB. Um, so in the very, very early universe, right, uh, just after the Big Bang, uh, the universe was basically primarily comp composed of uh, hot, dense hydrogen plasma. Um, and as time went on, uh, very soon after the Big Bang, the universe expanded, also known as inflation. And because of that quick expansion, the plasma cooled. Um, and Plasma cooling leads to what's called recombination, which is where all of the hot dense hydrogen plasma starts to form into uh, neutral hydrogen atoms uh, with the protons, neutrons, and the universe starts to become transparent. So in the beginning, it was this hot, dense, uh, opaque plasma, and as it cools, it becomes transparent. Um, and this transparency is very important um, because it allows for what's called photon decoupling. Um, and this photon decoupling happens when these, this neutral hydrogen forms, all of these photons, the extra energy bouncing around, they're allowed to do what's called free streaming, which means they're allowed to stream between the particles without uh, any interference from the hydrogen plasma. Um, and this creates what's called the surface of last scattering, which is also known as the CMB. Um, and this is what we study with our telescopes here. Um, specifically with the Simons Observatory telescopes, um, but there are a lot of other instruments out there like SPT, CLASS and whatnot who are studying the cosmic microwave background um, and are trying to understand uh, the steps that went into uh, everything after the CMB and just before as well. Um, so how do we actually get these different uh, anisotropies or these little temperature differences that we see in most of the CMB maps uh, that are published? Um, so if we had a completely uh, homogeneous plasma um, where there was no anisotropies or there was no primordial perturbations or no bumps or shaking in the universe in the very beginning, we would have in the sky, we would see just a large orange cloud, same, dist or same uh, temperature, and it would be a nice little black body. Um, but instead, what we see is this CMB with these cold spots, these hot spots, um, and these matter density, over densities and under densities. And that actually forms because of the primordial perturbations, which I had mentioned back here, that happened in the hot dense hydrogen plasma. So these primordial per perturbations or these primordial baryon acoustic oscillations, which are tiny little uh, differences or little jolts kind of in um, the hydrogen atoms. Um, and then you get inflation, which basically exacerbates the problem. You get all these tiny over densities and under densities. And when inflation happens, it just kind of makes them worse or it pushes them to one extreme or the other. 
Um, so this nice little graphic on the side, I like this for showing um, kind of the way that things travel in time. Uh, you have this hot plasma that's pretty homogeneous, um, and then oops, you get these concentrations of dark matter or these small oscillations um, in the universe, and they basically start to gravitationally attract. You get some baryon acoustic oscillations, a sonic motion here, and the inflation forces them to group more quickly together and group into more dense regions. So you have these hotter regions, these colder regions, which is what we're seeing here in the CMB when we uh, look at them with our telescopes. Um, also, if you guys have any questions at any point or if anything I'm saying sounds uh, incorrect or confusing, just please feel free to interrupt me and let me know. <laughs> um, so why do we actually care about the CMB? Uh, what can we learn from it? Uh, we can learn a lot about uh, the CMB anisotropies, so the temperature anisotropies that I had mentioned before, which is the maps that we typically see of the CMB. Um, we can look at the polarization anisotropies, so the ways that different light um, interacts with the media around it. Um, we can look at some of the primordial perturbations, um, so we can study the uh, current st state of the CMB or the, uh, the surface's last scattering and understand some of the perturbations that uh, we would expect, the baryon acoustic oscillations we would expect um, in the early, early universe. Um, we can also use the CMB to study, study the history of structure formation. Um, so we can look at things like the cluster distribution and see how it affects the light that's coming from the CMB. Um, we can talk about the expansion history of the universe, if we know what the, the light is supposed to look like coming from the CMB, and then we know what we're observing. We can look at the lensing potential, uh, different galaxy evolution. Um, we can also put constraints on things like the neutrino mass by using things, uh, baryon acoustic oscillations um, with instruments like DESI and whatnot. Uh, we can also look at the overall matter distribution in the universe, which kind of goes hand in hand with the cluster distribution. Um, which tells us a bit about dark matter, about how it reacts and how, about how it's uh, interacting or non-interacting with uh, other objects. And we can learn a lot more. Um, so on the right here, you can see a nice little graphic just talking about structure formation uh, by Kravstov. And then this is also from uh, the SO forecast paper. So the Simons Observatory forecast paper where we talk about all of the things we plan to measure with Simons Observatory. So now um, we can go into a little bit of detail about the Simons Observatory itself, since we know a little bit about the CMB and what we might be able to learn from it. And I'll give a bit of background on what the Simons Observatory actually is. Um, so it is a very large collaboration, the largest one that I've been a part of. Um, and it includes 40 plus institutions, 10 plus countries at this point, and over 200 members. I think we're actually above 300 right now. Um, this is from our last in-person face-to-face, which was two years ago at this point. Um, and these are all of the institutions down at the bottom um, uh, that are contributing to the project in some way. And over here is uh, the group of people here at UPenn um, with our very recent addition to the telescope, to the receiver here with all of our optics tubes inside. But these are um, some of the great people I get to work with all the time um, in building this. So just a little bit about the observatory telescopes. Um, there are going to be four telescopes in total. Uh, there will be one large aperture telescope, which is what I'm gonna tell you uh, more about later on, um, which has a six meter primary aperture. Uh, the receiver that I'll be talking about is inside of here. There will also be three small aperture telescopes, which have uh, ha basically half a meter aperture. They look uh, pretty small here in the picture, but um, this is what's inside or included inside of um, the uh, structure here. And this is about as tall as a person. So I'd say uh, like six feet tall, if you maybe go up to the top, it'd probably be closer to eight feet. Um, but there's probably somebody here who has worked on the SATs uh, that might be able to correct me if I'm wrong. Um, they will all be grouped together at the site, which I can show you on the next slide. Um, the observatory will be located uh, in the Atacama Desert, Cerro Toco in Chile, uh, which has an about 5,000 or 5,200 meter elevation. It's nice and high and nice and dry, which is very good for CMB um, astronomy because we care about the CMB photons coming from the CMB, which will interact with the moisture in the air. Um, and so the water basically absorbs the incoming photons um, and can't see anything if it's uh, really 
really wet, which is why usually people go down to the South Pole, like the South Pole Telescope, or a lot of people like to build their experiments here um, at the top of uh, straddle volcanoes in Chile. Um, so this is a really nice picture over here of the site. You can see a lot of the telescopes that are currently there and some of the uh, building structures and infrastructure that's there. But some of the neighboring telescopes that'll be very close by, um, this is where Simon's Observatory will be located. You can see the three small aperture telescopes here, and then this will be where the large aperture, aperture telescope is. Then we've got a uh, class and also ACT, the Atacama Cosmology Telescope, and then uh, the Simons Array, which is also um, part of the same Simons Foundation that's helping to fund uh, the Simons Observatory, uh, is located just over here. Um, so now I'm going to dive deep into the design of the telescope, both the LAT and the LATR, so the receiver itself. Sorry. So um, I have quite a bit of experience with the receiver at this point. I jumped into the project just as they were starting to uh, put everything together and develop some of the optics tubes and whatnot that go into the, the telescope receiver. But I was not here for the telescope design, um, although we have uh, some great members in the lab here who <laughs> were very involved with it. Um, but I'll give you a, just a brief overview of uh, the telescope itself, and then I'll go dive deep into the receiver, as I mentioned. So um, the LAT, or the Large Aperture Telescope, is uh, a cross Dragon optical design, um, which is just talking about the way that the mirrors are set up here with this receiver cabin. It has a six meter primary mirror shown here um, and a secondary mirror here. This whole elevation structure that you can see up here actually rotates um, around the elevation axis. And also there's a bearing down here that allows it um, uh, to rotate in that direction as well. So um, the telescope will cover six frequency bands, uh, that being 27, 39, 93, 145, 225, and 280, uh, with TES detector arrays that will be mounted inside of the receiver cabin. Um, and it'll survey approximately 40% of the sky uh, with arc minute resolution. Um, the sheer size of this thing always surprises me. I work with the LATR, which I think uh, is huge by itself, um, but then just realizing that this thing is going to be 15 meters uh, wide and 15 meters tall. Um, I think it's crazy, uh, although GBO is large as well, so <laughs> I guess it won't really stand up next to that. Um, so the LATR itself, uh, which is the Large Aperture Telescope Receiver, which you can see here, um, it connects to the telescope via co-rotator rails um, that allow it to rotate uh, uh, as well as when the telescope is rotating, so you can um, compensate, compensate for um, any discrepancies there. Um, so the LATR itself is 2.6 meters in length and 2.4 meters in diameter, and it's got a six point, or it utilizes a 6.7 degree field of view out of, uh, I think what is available is a 7.8 degree field of view. Um, it will be equipped with 80,000 uh, plus TES detectors um, in the future. Uh, that is its full capacity when it's got 13 optical tubes inside, which I'll explain what they are later on. Um, yes, so it's got a, a capacity for 13 of those and they're 40 centimeters in uh, diameter. It utilizes um, a dilution refrigerator to cool it. And then it also utilizes uh, two PT90s, which are pulse tube coolers and two PT420s to bring it down to both 80 Kelvin and 40 Kelvin and four Kelvin as well. Um, and it has the capacity for another PT-90 and another PT-420 uh, when the um, remaining optics tubes are installed. Um, so this thing is pretty complex and um, quite awesome. <laughs> I think it's very interesting to see how everything works together and fits together and that you're able to design something like this to fit inside of a, such a small cavity. Um, and so we've got the vacuum shell that you can see here, which is the gray portion. Uh, all of the DR, which I mentioned before. We've got the readout crate, which will house all of the electronics that uh, read out the detector modules. Um, we have our vacuum windows here in the front, our front vacuum plate. And then as I mentioned before, the co-rotator, which is going to mount inside of the telescope. So this structure that you'll see here, or that you see here, um, is what will be mounted inside of the LAT and will allow the uh, receiver to uh, rotate along the central axis. 
Um, there's also some support rings that we use uh, to mount a bunch of different components to. And we've got our cable hub, which allows us to feed into the cable wrap that you could see here, which again allows for motion of the LATR without uh, breaking any cable, uh, any cables or hoses. Um, so the receiver itself has six temperature stages, if you count uh, room temperature, of course. It's got the 300K vacuum shell, which I talked about before. Then it has its 80K filter stage, which you can see right here. Um, that 80K filter stage has an, um, a 180 watt uh, cooling capacity. So when I mentioned before about the PT90s and the PT420s cooling, uh, both the 40 Kelvin, 80 Kelvin and 4K stages, um, they are what determines, of course, our uh, loading capacity that we uh, have to be below. Uh, on each of these stages. So the 40, as I mentioned, the 80 Kelvin stage has an 80, 180 watt capacity. The 40K stage, which is shown here, um, has a 165 watt capacity. Um, and then the 4K mounting stage, which is shown in purple here, where the optics tubes mount to, um, has a six watt capacity. And then we've got our one Kelvin stage, which you can see part of our cooling bus back here. Um, and then you also cannot see it right now, oh, no, you can, inside of the optics tubes. Um, there, this connects to the one Kelvin stage here um, and that has a 17 milliwatt capacity. And then the detector stage, which is just below this filter you can see here, um, has a 500 microwatt capacity. Um, and as you can see, those get much smaller as you go down to uh, smaller and smaller temperature stages, um, which is why we have all of these filter stages. Um, so we need to use IR blocking filters to prevent a lot of the excess loading and radiation um, from reaching our detectors and for cutting out bands um, that we don't care about at our detector stages. Um, so we also employ this uh, very interesting um, piece of hardware here called a G10 tab, um, which is uh, both thermally isolating and um, extremely mechanically stable, um, which I'll talk a little bit about later on when we discuss the uh, mechanical validation of the cryostat. But um, there's a ring of these, which you'll see in some pictures coming up, um, that support both the 80K stage and then the 40K stage as well. Um, and they allow it to be held in place while also thermally isolating it from the 300K shell on the outside. Um, so yeah, we can keep moving on from here. So these are some pictures. I think it's awesome to be able to see a 3D model like this, but I think it's even cooler to be able to compare um, a, an actual piece of equipment in person to the 3D model. Um, and this is our 40K stage um, and our, yes, uh, the G10 tabs that you can partially see here covered in multi-layer insulation. Um, and this was all assembled up in Dynavac at, uh, in Boston, which is the company that helped to um, create the, or uh, to manufacture and assemble um, the cryostat uh, with our help. And this is the vacuum shell here. You can just see, this, see the sheer size of it. Um, and the, this is when it was empty back in uh, two and a half years ago, three years ago at this point. Uh, yeah, two years ago at this point. Um, there's some more pictures here that you can see again, just the sheer size of this. Um, this is the front plate on the left-hand side with the snowflake pattern for the windows. And this is the cryostat itself mounted to um, an ALM, which is basically just um, a large stage which allows us to rotate the cryostat um, along this axis, which uh, gives us access um, to both the bottom and top of the cryostat and allows us to be able to take uh, components in and out of the cryostat easily. Um, and this is the cryostat when it was first full assembled when we were doing our vacuum checks. And as I mentioned before, we have the four Kelvin stage, the one Kelvin stage and 100 millikelvin stage. Um, and the one Kelvin and 100 millikelvin stages are called using or cooled using um, the dilution refrigerator, which is connected to the structure you see here that looks like a, <laughs> um, a nice little snowflake. Um, and uh, that is called our thermal bus. Um, and these buses are at one Kelvin, as I mentioned, and 100 millikelvin, and they have cold fingers, which you can kind of see here, um, which extend down and connect to a mating cold finger, which exits the optics tubes and allows us to co uh, cool the focal planes and readout components that are inside of each of the tubes down to the necessary temperatures. Um, and our dil dilution refrigerator, this is right after we had installed our first optics tube here. 
So just to dive a little deeper into um, what is actually contained inside of the cryostat. So over here, you can see in the model that there are um, seven optics tubes installed, or there's an optics tube here. And the way that they mate to the four Kelvin stage is uh, by bolting a flange for the optics tube um, onto the four Kelvin stage. And then they protrude all the way down um, to just about um, an inch above uh, the backside of the uh, 40K plate where the filter sits. And so if we break open these optics tubes, we can see they're uh, very complex. And this is what I have the most experience with. So I helped to build, um, currently we've got eight of them built uh, of these optics tubes here at Penn. Um, so I'm very familiar with the amount of screws and washers and uh, nuts and bolts required to put this together. Um, and also all of the readout components that are needed to assemble. Um, so if we start from the right hand side, uh, moving from what would be the sky side where the photons are entering the optics tubes. Um, we've got the 4K optics here with some filters and our lenses. And then we've got our 4K absorptive tiles, which basically absorb any excess radiation that may be bouncing around this cavity or may be bouncing off of any of the filters or lenses at lower stages. Um, and then we move on here and we've got our lens two, which is held at one Kelvin. Um, so this is a four Kelvin shell on the outside. And inside of here, you can see a carbon fiber structure that allows us to support all of our one Kelvin components here. Um, we've got our Leo stop here that is also has absorptive tiles on it. Um, and we have our baffles again to control the beam and excess light. Then we have got our third lens here. Um, and then we have a thermally isolating carbon fiber structure that holds our 100 millikelvin stage where all of our detectors will sit and also um, another filter. And also if we continue back, we've got our 1K radiation shield to uh, prevent any excess radiation from reaching the detectors. Um, and all of our one Kelvin readout components that don't need to be held at 100 millikelvin are mounted here. And then if we continue back, we've got this uh, tan looking structure here, which is actually um, an A4K uh, or, um, manufactured uh, magnetic shielding which is made by uh, Ambuniel Corporation here in Philly. Um, and that, as the name suggests, prevent any, uh, prevents any um, magnetic flux from entering um, and uh, reaching our detectors. And we also have a series of readout components that are uh, mounted to the back of this that need to be uh, heat sink to a uh, four Kelvin cavity. So there are 205 mechanical components in each of these optics tubes. Um, there are more than 64 pieces of coax, more than 670 readout components, uh, <laughs> thousands of screws, thousands of washers, um, and about 240 tiles um, in the front end of this optics tube. So there are a lot of components that go into each of these tubes. Um, and yes, they require uh, quite a bit of precision in order to hold them all together. So again, as I mentioned before, um, there are these 4K uh, absorptive tiles that we mount on both the, um, the upper 4K structure here, and we also meant a, or, sorry, mount a different version of these tiles, a flat version, to the Leo stop to control any excess light um, that may be entering the cavity. Um, there's, like I said, 240 tiles per tube. Um, they control a lot of the stray light coming from uh, M2, and um, they were quite... Uh, um, quite a time and an experience investment, I would say. Um, a previous postdoc that we had here, Gilles Joux, uh, helped to design these. Um, there's a nice meta material paper on these. Uh, and they are supported by screws that screw into the backside of them. And like I said, they prevent any excess light from reaching uh, the, the detectors. Hey, Anna, so, yeah. out of curiosity, how long does it take for you to actually uh, apply all of these tiles and, <laughs> or in general, uh, construct one of these tubes? Um, it depends on how many helpers I have, no. <laughs> um, but to assemble this upper 4K tube is probably at least, uh, I'd say three hours um, to get these tiles in there. They're quite a snug fit. So you have to do some, a uh, little bit of wiggling um, <laughs> and a lot of uh, hand tightening of screws. It takes a couple of hours just to do this upper 4K portion. Um, to assemble an entire tube from uh, start to finish with all of the readout components um, is probably about three days. Um, 
and that is without uh, any of the optics components that we currently have. Um, so that would be removing or installing all of the readout components, uh, making sure that everything is a tight fit, um, and then checking everything would take a couple of days on top of that. Um, so each of these tubes is a, a labor of love. Um, <laughs> and uh, yes, so um, it would take a couple of days, I would say. Um, and so if we were to break down the optics tube even further, as I mentioned, the 1K components that are included in here um, are the 1 Kelvin cold finger, which you can see over here, that cools all of these readout components shown here to 1 Kelvin. There's some missing components too. Um, and this whole structure um, will potentially be tin plated um, to help, again, with uh, trapping and expelling flux that would enter um, into the optics tube. Um, we've got the lens here, as I mentioned, that's also held at 1 Kelvin and the blackened 1K baffles that are blackened with carbon loaded die cast. Um, and the Leo stop, which you can see here that has the flat tiles on it. It's not reflective, which I think means we're doing our job correctly, right? If no, <laughs> if we can't actually see the structure on top. Um, and these are the absorptive tiles that have been tested and cooled um, and uh, yes, recently published on. And then we've also got the lens two and the 1K filter stack shown down at the bottom here. So if we go even further um, into the 100 millikelvin components for the optics tubes, um, we are going to dive deep into the, <laughs> the readout components that are here. There are a lot of them. Uh, Bob Thornton here at uh, University of Pennsylvania and at Westchester University um, put a lot of time and effort into making sure that all of the components that needed to be included in the optics tube um, were included in the most compact way um, and in the most efficient way um, with the shortest length of cables um, and the least amount of loading, which is the most important part here. Um, so as I mentioned before, we've got these cold fingers, the one Kelvin cold finger and the 100 millikelvin cold finger um, that extend down into the optics tubes. Um, and they mate with the thermal buses that I had shown um, in the pictures beforehand um, that allow us to cool the one Kelvin stage using the dilution refrigerator and the 100 millikelvin stage using the dilution refrigerator. Um, and these units down here are going to be the UFMs. Um, <laughs> they're a little off from what the current design is, but they, uh, this is what, the way that they'll sit. They're um, a hexagonal box shape. Um, that mounts onto what's called our focal plane base plate. Um, and again, there's a filter cell down at the bottom here. This carbon fiber structure um, is meant to both support uh, the many kilograms of weight that will be suspended on this focal plane um, and also make sure that it's thermally isolated from the one Kelvin uh, stage that is just below it, that it is mounted to. Um, then we have, as I showed before, the tin plated 1K radiation shield um, where we have a series of superconducting um, coax uh, feeding from one Kelvin to, or feeding from 100 millikelvin, I should say, to one Kelvin. Um, and we have then uh, hand formable coax, since it's a isothermal, um, we can use hand formable copper coax uh, going from the one Kelvin stage to um, another bracket that mounts on the one Kelvin stage. And then we have some isolators and some DC blocks here. Um, that then connect up to um, a stage that's held at 4 Kelvin with, through some uh, superconducting coax again. And then that all gets fed through, uh, again, some hand formable copper coax uh, up to 4 Kelvin. And this is where our uh, magnetic shielding acts as also uh, a mounting stage for us to be able to mount our coax and also our low noise amplifiers that are held at 4 Kelvin and also our PCBs, which help to control and power our um, LNAs that are up here. All right. So this is what it looks like in real life instead of just in the model. Um, it's nice and gold, just like in here. <laughs> um, and we've got our 100 millikelvin cold finger coming up here. This is our focal plane base plate um, where the detectors will be mounted in the future. Um, again, this is where all of the hand formable coax, our loopbacks, and our um, superconducting coax is shown here. Then we also have thermometers that will be placed um, two per, U or per FPB, and that will allow us to um, uh, be able to measure, of course, the temperature of the focal plane in order to make sure that our, um, our UFMs and our detectors are operating the proper temperature. 
Um, we also have a heater here because um, oddly enough, we're getting this thing too cold, um, which usually isn't a problem that people face in telescopes, but we're getting our focal plane too cold. Um, so we like to heat it up to the perfect temperature for our detectors to work properly um, with the least amount of noise. And yes, so we'll use the heater for that. Again, these are some more pictures. On the left-hand side, um, you can see uh, a couple of detect devices that are under test right now. Um, so we don't have a full UFM here at, uh, sorry, UFM stands for Universal Focal Plane Module, um, which contains both the readout components um, like the multiplexing chips and also uh, the detector TES uh, wafers and also the horn coupled uh, or the horn coupling arrays um, that will uh, be mounted together into one unit called the UFM. Um, and that unit will, as you can see here, be mounted into the screw pattern. Um, we'll have three of those per optics tube for all of the uh, mid-frequency optics tubes, one per optics tube for the low-frequency optics tubes, and three also for the ultra-high frequency, which is our UHF optics tubes. Um, and here you can see these detect uh, devices. Since we don't have a UFM here, we do have uh, a couple of devices, one called the single MUX box, which is uh, basically just um, a multiplexing chip. Um, and then we also have, uh, with resonators, I should say, sorry, and we have our um, SPB, which is a single pixel box, um, which is a dark box that doesn't have, uh, isn't optically coupled to anything. Um, but it allows us to be able to uh, test our readout components and also be able to test that our temperature, um, the temperature of our focal plane base plate is actually correct. Um, and so here you can see some of the cabling coming out and the DC cables um, that will travel from or to the future. Uh, UFMs all the way out to the four Kelvin stage and out to the uh, outside edge of the cryostat to the readout um, readout flanges. Um, so on the right hand side, you can see three uh, semi complete optics tubes that were installed a couple of months ago. Um, we have gone through stages of installing one optics tube and then three and now we actually have seven installed right now. Um, and the purpose of that is even though we might not be able to install all of the readout components, we can understand the thermal stability um, and the thermal performance of the LITR uh, by installing all of the thermal mass onto each of the stages. Um, yes. So you can see here on the left-hand side, the first time, or uh, the process of us installing the first three optics tubes. Um, we've had one optics tube completed um, since last year, and we have been working for the past year or so to complete uh, seven additional, I should say we have had two optics tubes complete um, since mid last year and we've been working to have um, a total of eight optics tubes, seven plus one spare um, complete in order for deployment. Um, and we have successfully done that so far. So um, this is us dropping it in on the left hand side. Uh, you can see that the 4K plate here has all of these caps where optics tubes will go in the future. Um, and as we take each of these caps off, there are usually filters exposed underneath. So we wanna be very careful when we're dropping these optics tubes in. Um, and we use what's called alignment pins on these optics tubes um, to make sure that the flanges are mating properly. And since we don't have a lot of, um, we don't have much ability or room to be able to bend down to uh, make sure the screws are aligning properly in the holes, we use these alignment pins when dropping the optics tubes. It makes things um, a lot safer for everybody. Um, you can also see the DR here on the side. So this was um, after we had installed all three optics tubes and you can see that one of them is fully um, outfitted with all of its readout components. And there were two of them that we had thermometry um, installed and uh, also all of the um, mechanical components, but we did not have um, all of the readout components at the time. You can also see a look into some of the coax highways that travel around the outside of the cryostat. Um, so those allow us to be able to uh, mate the back of the optics tube to the universal readout harnesses, which are here, um, which contain other readout components, um, can, uh, like 40K low noise amplifiers um, and some DC cabling that allows us to, again, access it from outside of the vacuum shell um, and also cool all of the components with the 80K stage, the 40K stage, and the 4K stage here. Um, and Jack, Jack Orlowski here at uh, uh, UPenn um, designed all of these coax highways, which was uh, <laughs> a big feat in itself um, and allows us, like I said, to connect to the back of each of these brackets on the optics tubes so that we can read out all of the detectors. Um, 
So now I'm just going to give you uh, an overview of the current LATR status since we've uh, talked about the design for a bit, just the assembly status and uh, what we have done testing and validation wise. Um, so in terms of the, me uh, sorry, the mechanical validation that we have done for the LATR, um, for the vacuum shell, um, we have validated that it holds vacuum with all of the windows installed. Um, and the front plate uh, deformation under vacuum is within our tolerance. It was exactly, I believe 17 millimeters, exactly as we were expecting um, from simulations that Jack had done here at UPenn. Um, and we were able to measure all of this uh, using a laser tracker um, for our metrology setup. Um, we also, for the 80K and 40K stages, um, the G10 tab supports that I had mentioned before, um, they support the expected load, which is always great when the, a component that you've designed uh, supports its expected load, but it does so um, with all the mass of the 13 mass dummies here that you can see that are supposed to uh, replicate the mass of 13 optics tubes, which will be its full configuration for the um, LATR. It does so with only allowing it to sag about two millimeters, um, which is incredible for the number of uh, surfaces that are mounted together um, and also just the sheer weight of something like this, the plate like this, uh, to have a structure that is thermally isolating but also um, able to support that much weight is incredible. Um, we also, the 4K stage, which you can see here where all of the uh, mass dummies were mounted to, uh, is able to support the weight of the 13 optics tubes uh, with minimal deformation. Um, which was a feat in itself. So Ning Feng Zhu here at uh, UPenn had designed this plate and made sure that we made sure through simulations uh, that the snowflake structure in between, which are um, these small pieces of aluminum, small, I say about three inches across, um, are able to both allow for mounting structure for the optics tubes, but also not allow for deformation when all of the weight is placed on, on the thin pieces of aluminum. Uh, hey, Anna, yeah. uh, just want to give you a heads up that um, we should probably wrap up in a few more minutes. Sure, no problem. Get to questions. Yep. So uh, some of the cryogenic validation that we've got for the uh, cryostat is just that uh, the loading is all within um, spec. Uh, some of it is a bit higher than we were expecting, but it's all um, within our capacity here at, uh, in, within the LATR. Um, and then the mechanical validation for the optics tubes, we were able to confirm that all of the lenses for the optics tubes through all of these welded joints, carbon fiber structures and glued structures were all with, well within tolerance um, for the optical components that were described, uh, the tolerances described by Simon Dicker here at UPenn. We were also able to cryogenically validate um, the optics tube uh, making sure that none of the components cracked or uh, that they chipped in any way and that uh, um, they all cooled to the proper temperatures. So we currently have seven optics tubes installed within the cryostat, like I mentioned, um, which is a big feat for us. All of the thermometry is installed. And as I mentioned, we also have two of the non-optical devices installed for readout testing purposes. So there's a couple pictures just kind of showing the way that uh, the status had moved through the optics tubes um, and installing them to the cryostat. So I'll just skip this here where we're <laughs> talking about when we plan to ship um, the cryostat, uh, hopefully in the beginning of early next year, but site testing and LAT integration should begin in the summer of next year. And first light is expected in the fall of next year. And then first science observations are spring of 2023. So uh, hopefully look out for some data releases <laughs> soon after that. Thank you. <laughs> um, does anybody have any questions? All right, well, thank you so much. Yeah. Um, that was an exciting look <laughs> at an upcoming instrument and receiver. Um, yeah. So. Uh, as you mentioned, um, if anyone has a question, please feel free to unmute yourselves um, or uh, submit it into the chat. I'll just briefly mention here too that this uh, this little thing here <laughs> within this uh, picture that I made, this is Ning Feng Zhu who works here at UPenn. Um, and this is uh, part of our dilution refrigerator components. This is our, our turbo, turbo station, I should say. And it just so happens to kind of look like uh, some form of space weapon. I thought it'd be funny to. <laughs> <laughs> All 
Um, so uh, I'll start things off real quick um, by simply asking, it seems like this um, receiver is going to be the only one installed on the telescope, at least for the time being? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, so, yep, it'll be um, outfitted with seven optics tubes for its, well, for, uh, one optics tube and then seven optics tubes for the initial deployment of the cryostat. Um, and then uh, in for SO nominal, I should say. And then for um, the future deployment, it should contain 13 optics tubes. So it'll be the only receiver. It'll just be outfitted with different uh, um, detectors and different optical tubes. Okay. And then do you have a sense of the total power that will be required to run LATR when it's on sky? Ooh, um, I do not. That is a very good question. I do not, but there might be somebody else on the call who does. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if there's anybody else on from the, the UPenn team who might be able to answer that. Uh, I personally do not know that though. And then do you know by chance the power source for SO will it be similar to ACT uh, other telescopes up there? Or, yeah, do you know how they're being powered? Um, I believe that uh, it will be similar to ACT, but again, a better person to answer that would probably be either Mark Devlin or if uh, Michaela Limon, who helps with the site, um, set up. I wish I knew the answer to those. Sorry, Charles. <laughs> Uh, hey, it's Jack. The oh, power consumption is about 10k per pulse tube, 10 kilowatts per pulse tube. So it's about 50,000, and then there's some other overhead for like the turbos for the pulse tube, for the DR, like another 5k. So I think it's about 75 kilowatts all in, plus whatever it takes to actually operate the telescope itself, like to rotate it. That only I think McKelly knows. Yeah, it is in the 75. Thanks, Jack. I might, <clears throat> I might have missed something from Damanto, um, but uh, what determines the, the, the size of the beam on the sky uh, for individual pixel? Uh, what determines the size of the beam on the sky for an individual pixel? Um, well, that would be a couple of things. Let's see. Um, that would be the aperture of the telescope, right? Um, so the beam coming into the optics tube, uh, but again, maybe someone else on the LATR team might have a better answer for that. So, so there are no any field concentrators, any horns anywhere, right? Even there are, sorry, at the front of the um, each of the uh, the detector arrays, there will be um, horns uh, on some of the detector arrays um, and others will be lenslet coupled as well. Um, so those will help to determine the beam uh, for each of the pixels. So even for the lowest frequency 27 gigahertz, you, you know, what size of a horn would, would that be? Um, that is still being determined, I believe, because they're still working on the, uh, the design for the low frequency uh, detector arrays. Thank you. Yes, sure. One of the slides said that the instrument will survey 40% 40 per, 40 of the sky. Yes. Is the, is the life cycle of the instrument that to complete that survey or there are specific experiment, experiment, experiment that, the, that the instrument will be used for? Um, so the experiment, as far as I know, uh, the LAT, um, will survey approximately 40% of the sky. It will not stop uh, after it's surveyed the 40% of the sky, um, as long as I believe the funding still continues. Um, but it's, uh, there's also a few other telescopes um, similar to the LAT, uh, one called CCAT, uh, that will be commissioned in the coming years as well. Um, and uh, yes, I hope that answered the question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and I suppose um, there is already a, a timeline or a, a, at least a rough idea of how long uh, the survey will actually take. Uh, yes. So um, 
again, these are things I should probably know the answers to, but don't haven't brushed up on in a while. <laughs> um, but I believe that the um, initial deployment or the um, initial uh, schedule for the telescope. Um, uh, somebody in the LATR team is probably listening and can correct me, or at least can enlighten um, <laughs> how long. Go ahead. It's five years, but it's not like an optical survey where you yeah. have to dedicate significant amounts of time to hitting the sky again. We hit the whole night sky at like a fairly high cadence. I think yeah. it's every couple days, couple weeks. So like you can add on, it's not like you have to add on another year to survey the sky again. You can, mm. if we get more funding, we can just keep surveying the sky. Yeah. Okay, great. Can I build on that question actually? Right, I know ACT, was surveying both day and night, but they did differentiate data from their day and their night. Are you gonna also survey during the day, but just treat it as less optimal data and still try to make use of it? Yeah, that's the current plan. Yeah. Subject to change, but. Cool. Thanks, Jack. <laughs> I appreciate the help. <laughs> Okay, and I think we can have time. I know it's uh, getting a little past the hour, but if anyone has any other short questions they want to ask Anna, then please feel free. But if not, then I think now is a good time to wrap up in case people need to get going to other meetings and things. So um, thank you again for coming to join us. And talking about your work with the receiver. Um, it's fun, if not overwhelming, <laughs> uh, every now and yes. then you get to experience uh, the, the physical work that actually goes into uh, the instruments we get to use observe with, observe with yeah. so often. Um, yeah, so. thank you so much for having me. No, I really appreciate it. This was a, a great opportunity. I've been to Green Bank uh, once and uh, <laughs> thought that place or was uh, a ginormous. It makes this thing look small. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. thank well, you so much again. <laughs> of course, yeah. And um, for those still on the call, uh, a quick reminder that as always, these talks um, will get um, uploaded onto our YouTube channel. There's a specific playlist for all of the Science Lunch talks and you can find the information on our website. So uh, thank you very much. And with that, everybody have a great week.